Well, moving on to our next session, safety and security are paramount for a nation to grow steadily. The Indian aerospace and defense composite market is poised for growth with the government focusing on strengthening the defense ecosystem and encouraging industry participation. And well, with that, we are ready for our next panel titled Guardians of the Nation, Strengthening India's Aerospace and Defense Sectors. And to steer us through this inspiring conversation, we have with us Parikshit Lutra. And may I please also invite on stage our esteemed panelists for this session, Air Chief Marshal R.K.S. Baduria, former Chief of Air Staff. A huge round of applause for him, please. Retired Air Vice Marshal Michael Fernandez, India Country Head Lockheed Martin. Rajinder Bhatia, President, SITM and Chairman, Kalyani Strategies, Strategic Systems Limited. Dr. K. Raja Lakshmi Menon, DS and Director, Center for Airborne Systems, DRDO. Ashish Saraf, VP and Country Director for India, Hills India and Vishal Chaudhary, Co-Founder, Zetwell. Another huge round of applause for our panelists and for our moderator. Over to you, Parikshan. Please have a seat, uh, ladies and gentlemen. All right, uh, we're waiting for Vishal to join uh, the panel. I'm sure he'll be here in a short while from now. But uh, increasing our manufacturing footprint in aerospace and defense, this is critical for more ways than one. Look at what's been happening in the aerospace sector in the last two years. We've seen supply chain uh, issues. We've seen issues with Pratt & Whitney engines. There have been supply chain disruptions which have uh, it really affected the serviceability of uh, civilian aircraft as well. And then you've got uh, two wars raging on in the world, the Russia-Ukraine war, which has been on for more than two years now, and the war that we see between Israel and Hamas, which has been on for the last uh, six months or so, and there is no clarity as to where it's going. It's escalating in the Middle East. It has become a crisis in the Red Sea as well. All of that is putting pressure on supply chains. Supply chains for food grains, supply chains for fuel, supply chains for electronic goods. And all these countries, if you speak about Russia, if you speak about Israel, they are major supplier of defense components. And this is hurting the world. And we in India are trying to overcome all of that with indigenous manufacturing. And we couldn't have a better panel with us today. Let me kick this off by speaking to Air Chief Marshal RKS Baduria. Sir, thank you very much for joining us. Give us a sense of the journey you've seen in the Air Force over the last 30 to 40 years when it comes to indigenization. Where are we with that indigenization journey right now? And how critical is the need today? OK, uh, if I talk about the journey, I think uh, we started off pretty well uh, in terms of uh, the aerospace industry getting set uh, after independence. And in 60s and 70s, when we came up with Maruth, if I have to take one example, uh, it was absolute, uh, you know, state of the art that time, and uh, ahead of its time in, in in basic design and capability. And somewhere down the line, we lost our way, and uh, uh, we we uh, totally almost became import dependent. And I, I I've seen a total resurgence in the last about 20 years, and I think that is led by the LCA program, the AWC uh, uh, that we have flying. Um, a series of helicopters, ALH, LUH, uh, the trainers, HTT-40. So, so that is the, the, the new generation of uh, equipment that has come in, which has changed this. So indigenization-wise, I think from uh, aviation perspective, military aviation, uh, we are in a good space today, uh, starting with the fighter technologies, which are absolutely uh, uh, today current. Uh, I think uh, fly-by-wire, uh, if you take a digital fly-by-wire, four channels, it is on the LCA, it is in the holy grail of, uh, you know, uh, doing some uh, these kind of technologies, composites, you take electronics, uh, automated system. Similarly, in uh, radars, in de uh, networks, uh, in systems, in weapons, a lot of work has taken place. So today, uh, from uh, Air Force and military aviation perspective, also uh, looking at Army and Navy requirements, I think we are in a good space. The challenge really is, uh, is the engine domain, uh, is the high-end uh, sensors domain, and of course, we have to start looking at next gen. Right. You're absolutely right, sir, and probably this is the reason why we signed the GEHL uh, deal for uh, fighter jet engine technology to co-develop, not just for India, 
but for the world as well? Uh, that is a question we will be coming to. But sir, as a veteran of the Air Force, uh, do you also feel that somehow DRDO's role, and we have uh, Dr. Menon with us here. She is the director for the Center for Airborne Systems at DRDO. Uh, I was talking to her a short while back, and, and we really felt that somehow the DRDO's role in our defense and security system is uh, never really explained very well. Do you feel that we don't give DRDO enough recognition? Uh, at times, yes, but I think uh, from aviation side, we must realize that DRDO was at the center of most of this technology's development. Uh, the LC itself you know, came up uh, uh, under DRDO. Uh, most of this technology are, are you know, very high risk and uh, high capital, uh, very uh, money intensive and mostly led by DRDO and thereafter uh, into our DPSUs. Some of it, of course, uh, came up in DPSUs, HTT 40, et cetera, entire uh, ALH. So it's a combination, but in critical technologies, DRDO has certainly taken the lead and has certainly done great work. So there is no uh, doubt in that, and I think I've uh, expressed this uh, sentiment uh, all along. Uh, but at the same time, you know, times are changing, and the rate at which if we have to become self-reliant we have to involve the entire industry. So today the need is to increasingly get our private sector, our MSMEs, our startups, and, and that is the new model to move that we faster, to, to move faster. Uh, Dr. Menon, that is what we were speaking about, that we need faster turnaround times, and that's something the DRDO is trying to do. But for the layman, could you explain to us, when you speak about airborne surveillance systems, like the Netra, uh, tell us how they have supported some of our most sensitive and critical military operations in the last five years. Yeah, so uh, firstly, thank the organizers for having me here. And uh, yes, Netra has been a very successful story, and uh, it has not been uh, developed by DRDO alone. The whole nation was behind. It has been fully with the guidance and support of Air Force, who projected the requirement. They had the belief in us that indigenously we can develop, and we delivered. So basically, uh, coming to how fast we could have done, or if you see, it is a very complex system of systems. Uh, it has got a multidisciplinary uh, systems to be developed, designed, and it is not a, a single domain expertise that is required. So it is a very complex system, and uh, we went ahead using the full system engineering approach, and uh, we used the expertise that is available within the country of having academic institutions with us who can actually help us in some of the niche technologies or the new algorithms that is required. We had the full expertise of the industry because we do the design, but manufacturing is done by the industries. But when we started at that particular time, it was the MSMEs who really supported us. And um, I would like to really quote and uh, acknowledge the MSMEs who really supported us. At times, there was no AMCs also placed, but being for the you know, nation, they all really supported us and said that, okay, if there is a problem, we will be there with you. So it has been only under that, this thing we could do. And this DRDO, uh, including the Semilac, and it is the first time that such a system was getting you know, certified uh, within the country with all the work centers, uh, the participating labs, the MSMEs, DGAQA, and Air Force have together worked to see that such a system is actually available for the country. How we can fast you know, produce for the next time is you know, trying to see that uh, the, go, uh, the users felt that having multiple MSMEs uh, during the maintenance phase is not a good approach. Mm. So they would like to approach one industry so we have now taken up for all of the future programs, we will have a DCPP, a development come production partner from the beginning itself with us. And that is the approach we will take. Mm -hmm. Second thing, what we have now built in in our uh, uh, development uh, process or uh, the acquisition process is, we will have the platform also a contract or the DCPP contract even before the CCS sanction, have it after the DAC approval so that we are not eating in the timelines of the project. Mm. So that way we will be able to actually fasten the uh, you know, uh, delivery of the systems. And uh, with that approach only we have put in more projects. Uh, based on the success of uh, Netra, uh, actually users have again believed in us and um, uh, interested with more programs. And uh, we are sure that we will be able to 
deliver to the uh, meeting the operational requirements and this time at a faster rate right so that you know ma'am uh, it's so nice to see you here hear your stories because you will be inspiring so many more uh, women across the country and when it comes to increasing the participation of women in the workforce in manufacturing it's very critical there the participation of in indian women in workforce is 37% we want to take it to 50% air force has been doing a great deal of work we've got women flying fighter jets right now they're training on rafale jets as well uh, it's all very very good news and very inspiring story so uh, a big round of applause to the women at drdo thank you and our women in the air force as well but speaking about faster turnaround time and collaboration with the private sector uh, mr bhatia if i could ask you and if you can wear your sidm hat uh, what kind of collaboration do you envisage between drdo and the private sector to somehow speed up things for our defense needs <clears throat> thank you so much <clears throat> um so your question is how fast we can make this collaboration go in fact there are a number of models which uh, have been now worked upon previously some years ago drdo used to be more like passing on bits and pieces of a program to the various industry elements but over the last few years they started with a new model which she also mentioned which is called dcpp which means development come production partner so here a industry joins hands with the drdo right up front and then is a partner to the development and then is a natural production partner when the product comes through one of the i think the most prominent example of this would be the atax advanced stored artillery gun system where drdo abinisho right at the start of the program in 2015 joined hands with two large indian companies tatas and uh, kalyani group and the product was realized in less than 2 years time today we are on the verge of securing a order for a very large quantity from indian army and hopefully it should happen in few weeks time so i think this is an excellent model which they had really come out with also there was a discussion going on and one time to come out with something like a strategic partnership with the drdo so that was another element which was kind of dcpp but going little further and then picking up indian industry but the most important part is that today drdo is treating indian industry at par with everybody else in the i would say including the dpsus in fact more work is being done by drdo with private industry than with the dpsus especially the development work most of it is being done with the private industry and uh, we are looking forward with great expectation to the announcement of 25% r&d to be given to the private industry and most probably that also has to be routed through uh, drdo we already have a program on technology development fund going on with them and probably with this additional 25% r&d i think will take us to the next level right uh, air vice marshal fernandez let me ask you about uh, lockheed martin you're heading operations for them here in india this is the biggest manufacturer of defense systems in the world now when it comes to deepening the footprint in india the us and india are working very very closely uh, indsex was a sign of that the prime minister's trip to the united states last year was a big step in uh, the india us industrial road map how do you see india as a manufacturing destination for the future uh, thanks to uh, zetwork cnbc and parikshit for having me on this panel uh, parikshit if i if i may start off let you know just to go back and set the uh, correct picture about uh, how we could move forward uh, as you said lockheed martin is the largest defense manufacturer in the world it's 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 absolutely right on top of its game uh, but that doesn't happen uh, easily uh, i think lockheed martin in 2010 much before make in india even was thought of or anything decided to come to india and they saw india as a very very promising place to put work into uh, FDIs were challenging. They weren't at the 74% that we have today. They were minuscule. Uh, there was not much skill level in India at that time, but still Lockheed Martin threw in the hat. We set up two JVs. Uh, I'm happy to have Ashish here. I learned about him only this just now before coming here. 
So we have two JVs, uh, Tata Lockheed Martin and uh, Tata Sikorsky in Hyderabad. And from 2010 to now, we have about 1,100 workers, many of them in TLM all uh, women, women who we've picked up after 10 standard, put them in an Hunar Shala, trained them, and they are working today in TLM all. Uh, so, so we are, we are quite sure India's uh, a good place to be in. It's a lovely place to put in work. I, I see this close cooperation only helping us go forward in a big way. There are things that would have to be legislatively changed because, you know, uh, the U.S. has uh, very strong uh, rules and regulations in place. We have a very uh, big difference in the technological levels that do exist. But I'm sure with this close cooperation and the roadmap that has been worked out, uh, both governments will find uh, ways to get around that. We already have the striker coming in shortly. We are looking in for some more, uh, uh, you know, equipment coming in through a faster route. And so uh, I think, I think uh, Lockheed Martin is quite sure that it has a long run way ahead of it in India. Right. And if I can properly uh, uh, just make an observation, the fact that you've got such a strong presence, you've invested so much in training the workforce, it almost makes it an Indian company altogether. You've Indianized yourself in India. Yeah, for sure. We're, uh, uh, it is still a JV. We've yeah, Indianized yeah. ourselves. I, I, I think we must have been the first uh, foreign OEM to come into the country. Right. And uh, uh, I, I wish I could invite you all to come to our uh, JV there and see how much uh, it has moved up. Uh, 24,000 square meters of, uh, of area. Uh, 1,100 people, all youngsters. Our average age in our JV is 29 years old. Highly skilled, uh, very, very competent, and uh, very proud of uh, uh, being in India, for sure. No, uh, fantastic, sir. Great to hear that. Uh, Ashish, if I can get you in at this stage. As we were hearing from uh, Air Vice Marshal Fernandez a short while back, they've put in a lot in terms of skilling the workforce. Does that become a hindrance sometimes in expanding the footprint in India. We were also speaking to Dr. Menon a short while back that when you look at critical technologies for the future, you need people with very special engineering skills. You need basic engineering skills as well. And somehow those skill sets are not coming by. Do you see that gap when you want to be a leader, you want to increase your manufacturing exports? Does that something that uh, need immediate attention according to you? So thank you, Parikshit, uh, and, and thank you for inviting Thales to this forum. Um, the short answer is no. Um, you know, we see India as a gold mine of talent. Uh, so a, a few stats, right? Last year, we, f we completed 70 years in India. So um, and at that time, it was not even Thales when we started India, uh, our operations in India. And Bharat Electronics was formed with the help of Thales. So our legacy goes back that long, uh, right? Um, we, we celebrated our 70th anniversary in India last year. Now, our footprint, I mean, obviously, it expands across seven cities, two joint ventures, two very large engineering centers that do some incredibly state-of-the-art uh, development here, including cybersecurity. Uh, FPGA, we are actually one of the centers of excellence for Thales for the world for FPGA. Um, we do open hardware research in India. Again, one of a few firms, we are actually doing funded research in India, uh, which we pioneer across the world. So Thales is one of the companies that's actually championing the open hardware research uh, for the world. Now, all these require substantial amount of skills. But what we found um, in India was that, number one, access to talent, and number two is the ability to train and deploy the talent. I mean, we, we literally give ourselves uh, 150 days from bringing someone on board to the point where he or she is you know, productive, delivering, delivering research, uh, delivering to, to our expectations in terms of avionics, human machine interface. So we do some really uh, cutting edge work here. Uh, but uh, for us, it's always been a goldmine of talent. Um, and 
Uh, we've actually recently opened another center in Bangalore that can house upwards of 700 people, and that's already started to, f uh, to fill in. We are already started to fill it up. So, uh, you know, the 70 years of legacy is also, I mean, obviously it's taught, taught us a lot, but our roadmap goes for the 70 more years and beyond to make this a center of excellence for technologies that go on the Rafale. So you'll be happy to know that we do the AZAR radar for Rafale here. We do the Spectra electronic warfare suite in India. Uh, uh, recently, we have also announced some investments in, 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 uh, in the aerospace domain. So all these just point to the fact that it's not only a market, but also uh, you know, a, a pool of skills that we are tapping for worldwide deployment. Right. Thank you, and great to hear that. Uh, Dr. Menon, but uh, do you agree with uh, uh, Ashish yeah. that the I skills would, yeah. are available, and do you feel that it's easier to attract those kind of skills to the private sector rather than to an institution like DRTO? Uh, yeah, so I would um, like to answer in two parts. So one is, uh, see, uh, the trend, recent trend within the academic institutions, because I'm also on the board of governors of two uh, universities, so what I see is, uh, I mean, institute is also looking at uh, you know, the students as, uh, you know, they are the customers. So what they need is what the universities are now providing. So they have now increased the number of seats in AIML and data science. Okay, that is required. But is it enough for a uh, you know, DRDO kind of an environment where we need multidisciplinary experts like RF? I mean, the kind of people, uh, number of people that is required in the areas of ECE and experts in the RF is really not available as many as used to be there. So it is just a caution that I would like to you know, bring out in this forum that um, universities should look at also what is required for the nation as a country, I mean, not be only for uh, government sector, even in private sectors, because if you are saying more and more defense uh, sector should be given to the uh, private industries. We need expertise in all these areas. So just having one section or half a section for ECE and um, nine or ten sections for uh, AIML data science actually is not a good trend. I think I just would like to caution and uh, leave it at that Very because I feel uh, there is a we need to take some corrective action at this stage. Right. No, that is important, ma'am. That yeah. is, as we are focusing on a skill development mission, it's yes. important to hear these views as well. Vishal, yeah. to get you And in uh, just one more point, yeah, if I can add, because even though the thrust is nowadays on Make in India, mm -hmm. the Make in India, what we are now looking at predominantly is on manufacturing in India. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is also on licensed production. Mm -hmm. But what we also need to take it forward if we want to excel as a nation is also design in India because that is innovate in India for the world. That should be the you know, uh, approach that we should take because today if you have made 100 systems based on licensed production, tomorrow a different variant you have to make, you will not be able to, especially in an aerospace uh, uh, field, unless you have the design uh, details with you. So that is why it is very important to go beyond manufacturing go for design in India, that is innovate in India for the world. Design in India, innovate uh, in India for the world. That yes, could sir. be uh, the mantra for the next uh, 10 years. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for those remarks. Uh, Vishal, to get you in right now, give us your aspiration as a startup in terms of manufacturing, in terms of contributing to defense manufacturing, and how easy is it for companies like yours, yours to get your foot in the door as far as government schemes go? It's it's very exciting time for private industry in the aerospace and defense space right now. Uh, the scale of uh, upgradation and modernization that's happening, or that has that has sort of uh, the train has just left the station. That scale is like huge and uh, and massive scale, and private industries can really help in complementing the established EPSU capacities which are there in the market. Uh, recently, the Raksha Mantri announced a, a, a production target in a short term of about three lakh crores. 50,000 crores of which needs to be made for the world, uh, made in India for the world. So private industry are in a very sweet spot today in complementing the existing capacities with the DPSUs and the organizations like DRDU today. Number two is uh, the, the buzzword is also transfer of technology, getting some of these foreign technology into India, ruggedize it, con I mean contemporize it to the Indian context, and, uh, and uh, provide service reliably to some of these equipment over the life cycle of these 
equipment which can happen if that, if that capability resides within the country. So uh, we are very excited at the prospects of this industry right now, and uh, we're very happy to be doing what we are doing. All right, good to hear that, uh, Vishal. Uh, Chief Marshal Bhaduria, if I were to ask you about the changing nature of warfare. Very recently, and we were speaking to some of our co-panelists, the Defense Secretary had told us that we're looking at a scenario right now where low-cost drones costing just as much as $300 could damage a big battleship. Uh, how do we prepare for scenarios like that? What kind of technology do you think that startups like Zetwork, the private sector, need to work on? I think uh, uh, looking at new tech and uh, threats like this and preparing for the future is the key. You know, where we are today, we have to change our entire mindset of how we are going to fight. Uh, Low-cost drones, you have loitering munitions, you have UAVs. These are, these are the new methods of uh, you know, warfare which, which we have seen the results. And I think that is an area we really have to start working. And uh, new startups, MSMEs, companies like Zedwork, this is an area that uh, they can do a lot. And it is so critical that uh, we bring in new tech and reduce the cost. And I think we are talking of loitering munitions, but very soon we should be talking of flying munitions. Uh, swarms of not only drones, but swarms of munition and collaborative swarms. That is what uh, uh, you know, the new warfare is going to uh, look like. Increasingly, I think from where we stand, uh, uh, the young companies, the startups, uh, the MSMEs, uh, also the big companies who should invest into R&D, what uh, Mr. Raj Lakshmi was saying, that uh, that is the key. That is really, for the new tech, we have to start working now. Uh, be it in UAV, be it in manned unmanned teaming, be it in uh, you know, cyber and space, which is absolutely a new domain. It is open, be it entire networking and you know, a communication domain, entire ISR chain, which we need to have 24-7 uh, ability to look anywhere, uh, ability to do AI, ML, and uh, control the new sense of munitions. Uh, that we have to really master. Further going on to uh, things like half-sonic weapons, new sensors, uh, you know, new weapons, uh, 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 heavy effect weapons. So there we have to become leaders. We have space to become leaders. And I'm glad a lot of foreign companies are here. They've done well. They've uh, you know, uh, invested a lot of uh, FDI here. But tech is what we should develop our own. And, and in, after a decade or two, we have to start uh, using their ecosystems. Currently, we should uh, get the supply chains established. And I think somewhere down the line, we have to balance our books. We have been importing for so long. After a decade or two, we have to start exporting, utilizing their presence here into their supply chains. I think that should be the key. Right. Uh, you know, a member of our audience, uh, Mr. Chaudhary, if I'm, yeah, we were speaking a short while back, and he was giving us a feedback, an important feedback about Make in India. Does that Make in India mean you should go out and make everything? We were speaking about aircraft tires. Is that right, sir? Yeah. yeah. So, Mr. Uh, sir, if you can take this question, when it comes to Make in India in defense, what are some of the things that we need to focus on future uh, it cannot mean everything. Make in India does not mean that you need to have an expertise in everything. You need to be making in everything in India. How do we prioritize? Uh, firstly, my take on Make in India, that's not meant to be exclusive. It is meant to be inclusive. Mm. Which means you are actually not trying to get into a watertight compartment. This is not the time, this is not the world where you can be sitting in a wat watertight compartment. So what does Make in India mean? Make in India means that you could be depending upon sources outside the country. You could be depending upon various other vendors sitting outside your country. You do have the intellectual property or the integration capability to undertake that job. It is not to exclude yourself from the globe. It's to actually include everybody. Only thing is, important thing is to keep that IP which is available so that you have unhindered access to this technology in case of crisis. Right. So this is the most important part. And make in India is all about that. Nobody can be sitting in India and trying to export products outside uh, can rely purely on Indian market. Mm. You would be sourcing some items from outside always. But as long as integration capabilities and IP lies inside the house, it's perfectly fine. 
Right. No, thank you. Thank you for uh, those remarks, sir. And we can continue the conversation uh, later as well, Mr. Chaudhary. Uh, Air Vice Marshal Fernandez, let me ask you about Lockheed Martin. How much are you sourcing from India currently? And how much of the sourcing could increase considering the close relations between India and US right now? And how India could emerge a supplier of defense equipment for the US? Um, so currently, uh, uh, Still going back to, our, uh, to what all we do in India, uh, today uh, we supply the empennages for the C-130 globally. Uh, we've exported about 212 of them so that you know that almost uh, uh, any C-130J that you fly, see flying in the world has its empennage. That's the entire tail section and, uh, and fin made in Adi Batla at Hyderabad. So we can be very proud about that. Uh, besides that, uh, we used to make the Sikorsky cabin uh, for the S-92, uh, which is the president's uh, uh, helicopter, Marine One. And now, very recently, uh, you know, seeing the, the, the potential that India has, we've put work for fighter wings into India. Now, the fighter wings that we put into India are, are, are high-tech. They're 9G, they're fuel-carrying, they're interchangeable. I'm sure Chief will agree with me when I tell you that getting an interchangeable wing is very difficult. As of now, when a wing, when, let's suppose you fly somewhere and you get battle damage during a war, the aircraft comes back, lands, the wing is taken off for repair, and the same wing has to be put back on that aircraft. Whereas here, with this wing that we are manufacturing for the fighters, you just bring in another wing, fit it on, and that aircraft is ready to fly again. So, so it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's quite high tech that we have brought in. Uh, and I want to say that, you know, finally we talk about indigenous content. We talk about, uh, Mr. Bhatia said about bringing the world into us. So when we brought the empennage into India, there was zero indigenous content. It was in 2010, we brought it in, started, everything was coming in from abroad. Today, that same empennage has got 94% of indigenous content. That means that in almost that entire thing is being made in India. So that's one part of the story. But what I want to say is that once you've got your supplier chain, once you've established quality control, once you've got all this going, when we brought in the fighter wing for manufacture here in India, the fighter wing started itself with a 70% IC. So that's what I'm saying about building an ecosystem here. And an ecosystem does not build by Sorry if I'm, I'm this thing, but again, going back to uh, Mr. Bhatia, make in India. Until you feed into a global supply chain, until you have volumes that can sustain that manufacture, it won't really support you. So the, it's very, very important to understand that volumes is what is required. You say make in India, you have something way, way back in Hyderabad, and now I'm putting on my Air Force cap and I'm talking about war fighting. Uh, China has the second ro uh, rocket regiment that can target every corner of the subcontinent, okay? If you do not have resilience in supply chain, if you do not have things coming from global sources, like we are seeing what is happening in the wars that are going on currently, you're going to be very, very badly hit. Very badly hit. And uh, so, uh, so those are the things that I wanted to bring about. about no, uh, very right, sir, about uh, resilience in supply chains. And this is exactly what the US is saying. When they speak about a US-India industrial roadmap, they speak about manufacturing not just for India, Indo-Pacific and beyond. Absolutely. You know, so it's a very uh, vast and there is a huge opportunity there for the manufacturing sector, but we need to move very fast considering our Chinese counterparts. Uh, let me now take the final set of comments. Uh, Mr. Saraf, if I can begin with you. Give us the kind of investments that you have outlined for India. Uh, MRO is an area where you are showing great interest in. Could you lay out the areas of interest for Thales in India and the kind of investments you're looking at? So um, I would say, let's say three or four areas uh, besides the one that we have already uh, narrated. Um, the existing ones are two large engineering centers, two joint ventures that are basically making the, you know, the Rafals equipment. Uh, MRO is a very attractive area for us. I mean, uh, some, some numbers around that. Air India has just said that they will induct six, uh, one airplane every six days, 
we expect with the backlog that the, the Indian airlines have combined that India will induct an airplane a week probably for the next 15 years. And we fell right in the sweet spot of that because Thales is an avionics provider for, for a lot, a majority of them uh, flying in India. So we just recently announced uh, uh, an investment in the MRO, avionics MRO uh, center that will come up uh, somewhere in the NCR region. Uh, we will be nearly doubling or even tripling our engineering workforce in the coming five to seven years. Uh, we are bringing more Rafale content here. Uh, so you will see the electronic warfare and the ASA part of Rafale bring, brought in more and more here. Uh, we started with uh, bringing the content for Indian Air Force. That's over, so now we are supplying for the global Rafales that get delivered across the globe to various countries, and a lot of content for that come in, comes into India. We are looking at uh, investments in Optronics. We are looking at investments in Vishorads, which is a very short-range air defense systems with our, our partners. We are looking at investments uh, on, on some of the, the guns with, uh, with our esteemed partner who's right here on stage. So, you know, we have a plethora of investments lined up and, uh, and, and you know, one after the other is already started to materialize to just take advantage of the market and the talent that's available here. Thank you so much, uh, Ashish Saraf. Uh, Dr. Menon, one final comment from you uh, in terms of uh, one big focus area that DRDO would be working on for the future. So one focus area is a little difficult, but I will concentrate on aerospace and uh, defense. Uh, so uh, basically, yes, uh, uh, what we are now uh, trying to do is uh, give uh, the users what is uh, projected by them with the approach that we have talked about. But what I would also like to say is, as of now, uh, DRDO is working on all kinds of platforms, maybe it manned platform or unmanned or uninhibited, I would like to say or uh, aerostat uh, airships. And uh, so these, on these, we have all the surveillance equipment and uh, available. In addition, as a fighter, of course, ADA, DRDO joint combined, we are able to do that. When it comes to manned uh, uh, surveillance systems, one uh, area I think, I mean, not that DRDO is presently looking at, but as country, what we should be looking at is having a indigenous airborne, I mean, indigenous uh, transport aircraft because Today, what we are facing is all kind of surveillance systems, whether we want uh, uh, for uh, maritime surveillance or for air-to-air -air detection or for air-to-ground uh, surveillance. We are now dependent on the transport aircraft from abroad and for missionizing it. So we are too much dependent on them. It may take few a few years, but it's the right time to start so that we have, and then as I told you, we know that we have the design details, modification on it, missionizing on right. it and uh, meeting all the future requirements of any of the services on those platforms will become easier. So all this right. is one thing, I mean, I'm not saying the RDO need to look at it, it is but as the a country. But the country needs to look at it, indigenous at transport it. aircraft already, and unmanned technology. Uh, already there is uh, some initiative also taken up, uh, so that is one thing that I feel will help. Okay. Apart from that, what the RDO is doing is well known, all right. and uh, we our, will be meeting our mandate to empower the nation with uh, indigenous uh, state-of-the-art defense good. technologies and systems. Good night. Thank good, you. Good to know, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Bhatia, now, over the last one year, we've been seeing a lot of interest uh, in the stock market when it comes to defense stocks, defense PSUs, uh, private sector defense companies, and this interest is going to grow because of the huge capex push of the government for defense acquisition. Just recently, the DAC uh, cleared contracts worth 80,000 crore rupees, and this, these numbers are only going to grow. 16,000 crores in exports last year. How do you see the manuf defense manufacturing to grow it in India over the next five years? What kind of export growth do you expect year on year? Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, it's a quite an interesting question, but uh, I think uh, just about two days ago, our Raksha Mantri did lay down the root map for achieving 3 lakh crores of manufacturing by 2728. We are today at 1,8 thousand crores. So you are looking at a, a three times or 300% growth in the next three years. Translated into actually CAGR 
this would be at all odds. This would be looking at something like 60% CAGR growth year on year. My own opinion and feeling is that our initial targets were $25 billion of growth, which was doubling what we are doing today of 12 billion, and which was meant to be done by 26, 27, which looks eminently achievable. In terms of our exports, we are today approximately about 16,000 crores. There are estimates we might go beyond this this year, in uh, year 23, 24. Exports can grow faster because there is an environment of uncertainty. You yourself mentioned about two ongoing conflicts and third one on the horizon. So exports can take a major impetus. I can see exports growing 20 to 25% year on year growth from here onwards. All right, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. We've completely run our time, but thank you very much for giving us a roadmap on the defense industry.